scripture and you may be seated. This is Bible study and we are going to do some Bible study. Everybody say Bible study. study. It's good for you. Amen. Amen. Mark 16 and 15. Mark 16 and 15. And we'll be reading both verse 15 and 16. So 16, 15 and 16, 16. And he said unto them, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Everybody say creature. He that believeth and is baptized, say baptized, baptized. shall be saved. But he that believeth not shall be damned. Y'all with me? Amen. Let's pray. Jesus, help us right now, God, with this apostolic doctrine Bible study we're going to do tonight. Help us to understand your word. Put it deep in our heart. Let us know it as truth. In Jesus' beautiful name. Amen. Turn to your neighbor and say, man, you're good looking. And you can be seated. Amen. Some of you might be lying, but we'll pray about it later. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. How many know uh, what apostolic doctrine is? Apostolic. Teacher, teacher, teacher. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. Like the, like the uh, apostles. Exactly. So if I were to say I'm apostolic, I would be um, intimating to you that I follow the apostles' doctrine. So I'm an apostolic Pentecostal. I'm a, 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 a apostle. I'm following the doctrine of the apostles on the day of Pentecost. So I'm an apostolic Pentecostal. And I hope you are too. Um, I am going to take the next month, the next month, the next four Wednesdays, and teach on doctrine. I have a lot of scripture to cover. I may not read it all, but I want to get this across to you. If you have pen and paper and you want to take notes, go right ahead. If you don't have paper or pen, I do. Anybody need a pen or paper? Okay. All right. Anybody need some chips to get them by? <laughs> oh my goodness, they're all. <laughs> put my favorites up here. Hey Amen. Don't get sidetracked, squirrel. <laughs> so, apostolic doctrine. If you were to say there was an authority in the gospel. If you were to pick a person that would speak with authority, my first guess would be Jesus. Anybody with me on that one? So when Jesus said, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. So the inference there is to preach the gospel. Part of the gospel to be preached would be the doctrine of baptism. Are y'all with me? So, I think baptism would play an, an, an integral part in the plan of salvation. So we're gonna we're gonna chase down baptism for the next thirty-five minutes. And if my microphone's too loud, it is red, and you can turn it down. Sounds good. It sounds good. Okay, I'll keep it. So. Mark 16, 15, go ye into all the world, preach the gospel. This is Jesus speaking as Mark has written it. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. So the inference is that if you don't believe, you're not baptized. And if you're not baptized, you're damned. Matthew 28, 19, and Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Ghost. So there again, Jesus absolutely stating that part of the gospel that is to be preached is baptism. Okay, this is kind of be an interactive kind of night, so we'll work together at this. Where baptism comes into play, and I'm, and I'm going to pretty much stick to the reason we need it, and um, how the formula was, was to be done. So, uh, we know that Jesus 
said that you got to be baptized. If you want to be saved, you got to be baptized. That's what he said. Um, he commissioned Peter in John 21, 15. Um, this is part of the commissioning. Um, there's two parts of it. John 21, 15. So when they had dined, Jesus said to Simon Peter, son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than these? He saith unto them, yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto them, feed my lambs. He says this three times to feed his sheep, to feed his sheep, to feed his lambs. He is, he is putting on Peter a commission to preach the gospel. Peter, if you love me, you're going to feed my sheep. Now, what is he feeding them? The word of God. He's preaching to them. In Mark 16 and 17, there's another commission given to um, Peter. And it's kind of famous. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. That is the, the reality of Jesus Christ being the Messiah. And he said also unto thee, Thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give unto thee the kings of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth it shall be bound in heaven and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth it shall be loosed in heaven so the Lord is commissioning Peter with a divine call to preach the gospel of course we know baptism is part of that gospel right so in Acts I'm moving quickly here because I'm getting to I got to get to a point but I got a lot of scripture to read we get to Acts, and um, there's this great outpouring on the day of Pentecost. The disciples were told in Luke to tarry in Jerusalem until they be in, endowed with power from on high. They're in an upper room. They're praying and, and worshiping. There's about 120 of them. There's this great outpouring of a miraculous spirit. They speak in tongues. That's Acts 2. And then um, the, the commotion brings the city together. There's this, this dynamic happening. I mean, it's, it's obviously like loud and, and noisy. It's, it's a feast day. It's, they're, they're, it's the Feast of Booths. It's Pentecost. And, and so there's Jews from every quarter of the, of the kingdom. They're from all over the place. And they're, they're in Jerusalem. And, and Peter gets up and, and well, they're, they're there and they see this commotion and they think they're drunk. They just assume, boy, these people are out of their mind. You know, that's how they think today. We're Pentecostal. We roll on the floor. I, by the way, I've never rolled on the floor. Not that I wouldn't, but I haven't. But I have seen plenty of people roll on the floor. I've seen people run the aisles. I've seen people do all, all kinds of things. You know what they're doing? They're practicing for heaven. Because, boy, when I get to heaven, I am going to cut loose and not worry about my back being thrown out or my, my knees going bad. I'm just going to worship. So there's this commotion. And, and Peter stands up under the anointing, and, and he refutes what they're saying. He says, these men are not drunken as ye suppose, seeing it's the third hour of the day. It's 9 o'clock in the morning. But he says, this is that which was spoken of by the prophet Joel, saying in the last days, saith the Lord, I'll pour out of my spirit upon all flesh. There's a great outpouring of God's spirit. That's, that's the revelatory, and we'll get into the outpouring of the spirit in a, in a different week. But... At that same moment when this great outpouring is happening, Peter gets up and he preaches this message. And they're all Jews. They're all Jews. Fifty days earlier, they were crucifying Jesus in the same, same quarter of the city. And now there's 120 of all the people that Jesus had healed, all the people he fed, tens of thousands of people in just a few, four, a few short weeks. There's just 120 in the upper room. Sure narrows down the crowd, don't it? See, time weeds us out. You're going to be dedicated to it or time's going to wear you out. So anyway, that might be Sunday. Um, anyway, so Peter gets up, he preaches this message, and he concludes it in Acts 2.37. And these men are speaking to him. He, he convicts them. He tells them how he crucified Christ and, 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 and how he rose again. And, and, then, and these men get convicted, and they were pricked in their hearts, and they said, Men and brethren, what should we do? Is what they asked Peter. What should we do? Peter in Acts 2.38 says, Then Peter said unto them, Repent, and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remissions of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. So 
Again, Peter's commanding them. Why would he give them that, that kind of statement if that was not what God wanted him to say to those people at that moment? Okay, so he gets up and he makes this bold statement about repentance. Who else preached repentance? John. Who else preached water baptism? John. So Peter is just following in the footsteps that John, the forerunner of the Lord, had prepared the way of the Lord with. Repentance and water baptism. But Jesus hadn't come yet, so there was no sacrifice for, for the, the remission of sin. That would come through the holy blood of Jesus Christ. So on Calvary, that blood was shed. So now we have a name to put with it. It's not just repentance. It's just not baptism. But it's in the name of Jesus Christ. That's where the blood is applied. Y'all with me? Yeah. So we're moving along here because we've got a lot to cover. God's moving. Now, I preached this not too long ago, kind of in this way, but it's new. God's moving. He's moving in Jerusalem, and he's moving all over the, the known world. As, as the word of God begins to spread out in these divine miracles, you know, Paul's walking along and healing Peter and people, and Peter's walking along and healing Peter, and, and the, the guy at the um, beautiful gate, you know, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have, give I thee. Peter raises them up and, and heals them, and he goes into the temple dancing and shouting, and, and, and things are happening, so people are starting to take notice. Notice, well, we thought this Jesus died because when he died, there was no more miracles. Matter of fact, when he moved, entered into Jerusalem, the miracles stopped. But now all of a sudden, it's like Jesus is back, but Jesus is not back. But he is. So the gospel's getting preached, and, and it, it gets down to Samaria, and Philip's down there, and he's teaching, and, and, and they're accepting, and they're like, we believe this, we believe this. And, and so Philip sends a message back to Jerusalem, says, hey, send me some people, because these people down here are ready for the word. And so you know who they call? Peter and John. What message does Peter preach? Anybody? Same message he got on the day he preached it. So he gets down there and he says, Then Peter said unto them, I'm sorry, now Acts uh, 8, 14. Now when the apostles which were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria received the word of God, they sent unto them Peter and John, who when they come down prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost. For it had not fallen on upon none of them, only they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. So here again, and this is six years after the day of Pentecost. This is running into, I mean, this didn't happen one day after the other. This was years later. There's this great outpouring. They're baptized in Jesus' name. Then they laid their hands on them and they received the Holy Ghost. How do they know they received the Holy Ghost? Anybody? Well, they heard him speak in tongues like they did on the first time. Peter would be a good judge of that, don't you think? When it, have you got it? Have you got it? Oh, yeah, you got it. Yeah, he's got it. Yeah, he got it. Acts 10. And Peter is preaching again, and he went to Cornelius and visited him. And, and while he's preaching, the Holy Ghost fell on all of them when they heard the word. And they of the circumcision were astonished as many came with Peter, uh, as many as came with Peter, because on the Gentiles also was poured out of the gift of the Holy Ghost. For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. So how do they know they got the Holy Ghost? They heard them. This is like eight years later, okay? This isn't that back to back. This, is, this time is passing. Same message. I'm watching you. I'm watching you. Yeah. Preach with me. Keep going. So he preaches this message, the same message that he preaches, and, and he has the same response. People get the Holy Ghost and they baptize him. And it says this, um, for they heard them speak with tongues, magnify God, Acts 10, 47. Can any man forbid water that these should not be baptized which have received the Holy Ghost as, as we? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. Then they prayed him to tarry certain days. Let me give you a little insight. See, the Jews thought they had Jesus wrapped up. It's us and Jesus. We're the only ones that got the Holy Ghost. We're the only ones baptized in Jesus' name. It's just the Jews. All of a sudden, Philip's down there talking to some Samaritan. And doggone, if he don't, if he don't start believing the word, 
And then they get the, uh, they went and got the Holy Ghost. And, and well, you know, if they got the Holy Ghost, God filled them with his presence. Maybe, maybe this will work on them too. They're not like us. They're different than us. But man, if they're speaking in tongues, we need to baptize them. So he baptizes them all in the name of Jesus, in the name of the Lord. When, when we get confused about things, it's because we get away from the apostolic doctrine. Don't go to some other doctrine. Don't go to some theology. Go to the Word. This is the same word that Peter, Peter preached that Luke copied. Okay? So, baptism. How important is it? 1 Peter 3.21 the like figure whereunto even baptism does also now save us. Let me say that again. The like figure whereunto even baptism doth now also save us. Not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I put this in a, a modern day translation so you, you could understand it a little better. It's, it's, I think it's the CEV, Contemporary English Version. Baptism, which is symbolized by that water, now saves you also. Not by removing the dirt from your body, but by asking God for a clear conscience based on the resurrection of Jesus, the Messiah. So, baptism is not to just take a shower. It's not to wash your, your body and be clean. It's not to get a bar of soap and shampoo your hair and, and, and get the toe jam out and scrub everything really good. That's, that's not the reason for baptism. Baptism is a spiritual event that happens in the natural. It's so you have a red letter day in your life when somebody asks you, have you been buried in Jesus' name? Your mind automatically goes back to the day that you were poured down into that water and you came up a brand new creature. I didn't feel clean, but I felt light. I was just 10 years old and I was running around the sanctuary on fire and you know nobody stopped me because they could see that boy's got it. There was a glow. What happened? I don't know. I, I may have some sins. I'm just a kid but I feel awesome. They asked me how'd you feel? I said I just I can't I can't express it. I, I, it's awesome. I, Brother Price handed me the microphone. I didn't know what to say. What happened? I got baptized in Jesus name. I heard him call it out when he put me down in the water and when I came back out something was different. <laughs> If you don't have the name applied, you're just getting wet. You want the power applied, you better call on the name. Y'all with me? Good. I had coffee before I came home, and my wife said, you want a cup of coffee? And I'm like, I didn't want to tell her. I already had one. I don't drink coffee after about 9 o'clock, because then I'm up all night. That's 9 o'clock a.m. I only need two cups all day, and I'm wired tight. Paul, he's a, he's a disciple, isn't he? Would you consider him an apostle? You better, he wrote most of the New Testament. Paul, in Acts 19, does the method matter? Sure does. Sure does. Don't get me a check and just sign it, Father. I'm writing you a check for a million dollars, honey. I want you to spend it. I'm just going to write on there. Father. Now go cash it. If I write son, just son, S-O-N. Is, is it good at the bank? Not unless my signature at the bank is son. Holy Spirit. No, no, nope, check's no good. My check on my checking account has to be written to whoever I write it to, but signed, it's no good. I mean, I could write you a check for a million dollars on one of my checks, but unless my signature's at the bottom, it has no validity because there's no authority. When I sign it, I authorize the bank to withdraw the funds to give to you. And now you have a million dollars and I don't. Don't ask for any checks because I don't have any money. <laughs> Acts 19 and 1. It was while Apollos was in Corinth that Paul passed through the inland districts and came to Ephesus. He found a few disciples there and asked them, Did you receive the Holy, Holy Spirit when you believed? And they answered him, No, we haven't even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. He, asked, he then asked them, Then into what were you baptized? And they answered, Into John's baptism. 
Then Paul said, John baptized when they repented, telling the people to believe on the one who was to come after him, that is, in Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. When Paul laid hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they began to speak in tongues and prophesy. There were about 12 men in all. What does that tell you? That tells you, if you want to know what, what name you're baptizing in, then you, have, you better have it sealed by the Spirit that it comes with. Now, if you're not getting the Spirit when you get baptized, I'm worried about the name. The authority of the name carries all the power. Go to Acts 4 and 12, my brother. Acts 4 and 12. <clears throat> it says, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name. Everybody say name. Under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. It's the name of Jesus. Two verses up correlates this scripture. It gives the, it gives the meaning to this verse. It doesn't say Jesus in this name, but two verses up it's talking about Jesus Christ and go all the way down. So the authority is come, it comes in the name. So when any of you do anything, what so Jesus wrote, or the, the apostle wrote, and I think it was Paul, it might have been Peter, whatsoever you do in name, in deed or in name, do all in the name, in, you know what I'm saying. Whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of Jesus Christ. I didn't have that in my notes. There is, a, there is something that is very confusing that, that I can't cover it all tonight, but I'm going to lead into it, and then probably next Wednesday we'll get into it. Were there any other noted places where they baptized with another formula? Anybody? Nope. Nobody? Okay, good. No, there's not. There's nowhere else in the Bible that they baptized in anything other than Jesus' name or the name of the Lord Jesus or the Lord's name, which is Jesus. But in, in Matthew 28, 19, and I've read this verse just a minute ago, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. What is that name? Jesus. Jesus said, I've come in my Father's name. That's Jesus. The Comforter who the Father was in, in my name. So the Spirit's going to come in Jesus' name. And of course, Jesus' name is Jesus. That's why we baptize in Jesus' name. And Matthew, being a Jew, understood this. Matthew was not a Trinitarian. He was a Jew. He was a theist. He believed in one God. He was raised uttering the Shema. He understands the, the infilling of the invisible, uh, um, unmeasurable, omnipotent, omnipresent God dwelling in that clay of flesh. The invisible God filled a, a clay, a jar of flesh. Colossians says, 115 says, he being the express image of his person. So he was the image of God. And we get confused. We try to make three. There had to be a spirit somewhere. Then there's God up in heaven because the spirit came down. Anyway, you, you've heard that argument before. But, but Matthew knew there was only one. So that's why he said the name. Otherwise, he would have said the names. That word in the, in the Greek is singular. And it only refers to titles. It's a pronoun. It's just titles. The name singular of the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. But nowhere in there is anybody ever baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. But they are, if you say the name Jesus. But that's not how the formula works. You do it in the name of Jesus. Are you all with me? So, the doctrine of the Trinity basically is formed around that one verse in Matthew. Of course, if you do a little study on Matthew, Matthew didn't write that book until somewhere in the 60s. That's 30 years after, basically after the day of Pentecost, somewhere in there. And it does not record what they did. It only records what Jesus does. And it stops as his resurrection and ascension. That's the end of the Gospels. All of them do the same thing. The end at the ascension. The church age starts where? Acts. 
it's the only book that records what the first church did. That's, it records the great day of Pentecost, the outpouring. It records everything that's, that's necessary for salvation, the plan of salvation. The, the goal of Jesus on earth was to provide a sacrifice. God's goal was to provide flesh that had blood that could be the first Adam that could redeem man from sin. And he gave that flesh a name, Jesus. And so that name, and, and this is where, you know, I'm going to get into this oneness next week probably. But um, that's where we say there's just one God. Because Jesus said, all power in heaven and earth is given unto me. Now, there couldn't be a second all powerful. Nor a third. If Jesus has all power, then he's the representation of the almighty God in flesh. When we get to heaven, will we see an old man with gray, long hair sitting on a throne? No. No. How about a seven-foot-tall, buff, young-looking dude? Kind of athletic. No. How about a little wimpy guy with long hair and big doggy puppy dog eyes? With a little blood spot, you know, a little blood spot on his hand? No. The Bible says, John, I, John, looked, and behold, and there was one throne in heaven. Wasn't no puppy dog sitting on that throne either. Uh uh. That was Jesus. You know, he come all humble the first time. Now he showed out his manhood when he drove him out of the temple. Okay, God had a little backbone. And he also, when he preached, he said, Eat of my body and drink of my blood if you're going to make it to heaven. And he scared everybody off. God's not afraid of his word. He'll preach it whether you believe it or not. And when you get to judgment, he'll be preaching it the same. It'll be written down the same as he spoke it. And you'll be held accountable for it. That's why it's so important to get it right. To get it right. How many know who Naaman was in the Old Testament? Anybody? Naaman was a, um, a general of the Syrian army. And um, he was a leprous man. And a little maid, a little Israelite girl that they had captured told him that, that there was a prophet in Israel that could heal him. And so he goes to the king there and says, hey, I need to go to Israel. And can you write me some letters? I need to go talk to them and hear about this, this uh, prophet that can heal me. So he gets the letters and he goes down there. And the king of Israel scared because he thinks they want war with him because they're making this up. Man, I can't heal anybody. And then he finds out it's not him. It's, it's a little prophet over here. And... Um, goes over to him and, and uh, tells him a little story and, and the prophet doesn't even go to the door. He sends Gehazi a servant and he goes and tells him what to do. And um, when he tells him, hey, go dip seven times in the Jordan River. You know what happens to Naaman? His pride attacks him. Do what? What? I could go dip in that nasty old Jordan River. There's all kinds of beautiful rivers in my life. I'll go dip there. Forget this guy. And he, he runs off in a steam and he's, he's going along. And then one of his servants comes up to him. They're probably taking a break on the road. And he's like, Naaman? Yeah. He said, hey, you know, if that man would have come out and, and asked you to do some great thing, scale some great mountain, kill some big beast. I'm making some of this. I'm dramatizing for you. Kill some big beast or do something dramatic and, and scary. and You would have done it. Yeah. What's wrong with just going down there and dipping seven times in the Jordan River? You know, after Naaman thought about it, it's like, well, that is kind of easy. And I need a shower. So he runs on down there to the river and he dunks himself seven times. And the Bible says when he came up the seventh time, his skin was his child's flesh. You see, that's a parable of our nature. God says, just dunk yourself in some water in my name. Let me fill your life up with my spirit and then just live for me. But no, we got to make it complicated. Well, is it, do I have to get all wet? I mean, do, do I have to get my hair wet? I've seen this one girl. It was so funny. This guy was trying to baptize her and she looked like she was ready. She was all, and she'd go halfway down and then she'd stop. And he was like, what are you doing? And he'd get her again and go halfway down, almost to the, almost to the water. And she'd stop. And then finally she looked over and I can't get my hair wet. 
and then her mama goes <laughs> and pushes her under. You know why? You have to obey. And our flesh, flesh, I don't want to get baptized because I don't want to look like a fool up there in a big blue robe and get all wet. Oh, you know what? If Jesus would ask you to go over here and clown mine at Everest, you'd be at base camp. I don't know if I'm going to make it, but I'm going to try. Oh, but you won't get over here in a little warm water for 30 seconds and let me dunk you down in that precious name of Jesus. Get you a towel unless you change in the room. See how our flesh is? We want to fight what's easy. We want to make complicated what's easy. God didn't say sprinkle. He didn't say pour some water over. He said dunk them. Full immersion in water. How many know what a mikvah is? A mikvah is a Jewish bath. And I read this scholar's commentary on why they poured water. Well, back in those days, they didn't have baths. Hogwash! Jews and Romans were the, some of the cleanest people. The Egyptians were extremely clean. You think a bunch of smelly bad Beth, they weren't. They were extremely neat and clean. The Jews wore white robes. They didn't even want to go outside with a speck. A mikvah was a holy bath. They would get down in the mikvah and cleanse themselves before they put on their priestly garment. Before they went into the the temple they would bathe they had perfumes and soaps there was baths all over Israel I've seen them I've been there there was water everywhere they had the Jordan River they had spring thy home they had the pool of Siloam I even read a commentary where where Philip was with the eunuch and the eunuch says there's water what doth hinder and the guy says it was probably summer and there was only water run, enough to run over your feet that doesn't say that it says they were both down in the water. How do two people get down in the water if it only went down to his, over his foot? Y'all with me? It's not that I'm trying to make a big deal out of baptism. But friend, if you're going to do it, do it right. I'm not going to spend $400,000 on a house and put it over here on some sand. I'm going to spend $100,000 on a, on a foundation that's going to last and going to hold the house up. The house is going to fall over if you don't put it on something strong. Baptism and infilling of the Holy Ghost and repentance is the foundation of the gospel. Jesus said, go and preach the gospel. Then he said, if you're not baptized, you'll be damned. Am I making this up? Sometimes I feel alone up here. I'm about to put the coffee pot back in the church. I might even hook up an IV drip. No, you're all pretty bright tonight. 1 Corinthians 1 and 12. Now this I say, that every one of you saith, I am of Paul, and I am of Apollos, and I am of Cephas. And I am of Christ. There's like a little argument going on, and Paul's explaining this. Then he goes on, he says, Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were ye baptized in the name of Paul? No. I thank God that I baptized none of you but Crispus and Gaius. Lest any of you should think that I baptized in my own name. Now, why would he bring that up? Why? Because there's significance in the name. If I baptize you in the name of Paul, of, of Saul, uh, it would be Saul of Tarsus, but Paul of, of Tarsus, it would do you no good. Because there's no authority and there's no power. Because Jesus said, all power and all authority has been given to me. So the remissions of sin come through me. Your sin, you'll still be in your sin unless you come by me. And the way you come by me is you get in the water in my name. Then you become a clean vessel. Then I fill you with my spirit. Then we're in relationship. Y'all with me? Yes. Man, I'm sweating bullets. No more coffee at 4 o'clock. You have to understand something about the Lord. I, I used this little example a couple of weeks ago, and, and it was hurtful because it is. You, you read it, it's tough. This man goes to war and... He promises God that if, uh, if you give me the victory over my enemies, the first thing that comes out to me, I'll sacrifice to you. And so God gives him his victory, and he overcomes the enemy. And on his way home, the first thing that comes out is his only child, his daughter. 
And, and he realizes how severe God is when it comes to covenants and promises. Let your yeas be yeas and your amens be amen. Let God be true and every man a liar. So when he said, Peter, on the day of Pentecost, who had the keys to the kingdom, had the power to bind in, in earth and bi it'd be bound in heaven, to loose in earth and it'd be loosed in heaven, on, on whose, whose rock, Peter, that rock would be the, the foundation of the church laid and was on the day of Pentecost, the great outpouring that drew everybody there so the preacher could preach the message of salvation to as many people at one time as could hear it. If he was that specific to make it that, that clean and clear and crisp that in the name of Jesus you should be baptized, then friend, I'm here to tell you that unless you've been baptized in Jesus' name, you have just gotten wet. Amen. Anybody falling out of their chair yet? Mm. When we preach and teach... We that preach and teach, you that teach at home, did you know when you begin to tell the word, you become accountable to it? Let me say that in the microphone. When you preach or teach the word, you become accountable for that word. When you begin to tell somebody about God, it, it says, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. There, there, it's okay to be a little wrong as long as you're willing to be taught right. John's disciples, uh, almost 20-something years later in Acts 19, they're, they're out teaching about repentance and, and baptism unto repentance. John's baptism. And they, were, they called them disciples. They were true believers. And, and when they ran into Paul, Paul knew something there was about them. That, hey, these, these men are intent. They love God. They heard about John and all that. But they've missed it when it comes to Jesus and the Holy Ghost. And this is 20 years after. They didn't have Facebook or the Internet. They had to do it the old-fashioned way. Hi, my name's Matt, and I need to tell you about Jesus. Can you got a minute? Sure. I'm on the hook when I preach the word. So I better make sure the word that I give is right and true. And so you can love God with all your heart and want to be saved like those 12 men. But unless you do it according to the word of God, friend, you're in trouble. So, I stand here tonight. Let's stand. Honey, if you can come play. It's nine minutes still. I stand here tonight challenging you to make sure, make sure that you have it right. Make sure that the method is correct. Go home. Study it. I get all the books you want, but just stay in the book. And if it don't correlate to the book, don't get some man's... I, I read probably 10 different um, commentaries from a whole bunch of popular uh, theologians, Latter-day, when, when I mean Latter-day, contemporaries within 100 and 150 years of my lifetime. Men that wrote, and they write from the view of the Trinity, and you don't have to be immersed. You can be sprinkled or poured over, or not at all. Just receive the Lord and you're fine. But that's not what God said. I got to go back to the book and make sure what you're telling me here correlates with what you tell me there. Because friend, the enemy is out there trying to deceive man he'll just write you off a little bit at a time before you know it. you're way off the mark why do you think Jesus said they come to him you've got the Lord we've cast out devils in your name and done all these works in your name and he's looking at him like man I don't know you I have no idea who you are you know what he's saying I don't know what doctrine you taught it's not the doctrine I gave if you're going to be in the doctrine, if you're going to spend the time to come to church, if you're going to spend the time to read the Bible, if you're going to try to do it, friend, do it right. It's not Matt's opinion. Go to the book. Tell me how the apostles did it. If you can show me where they did it different, show me because I want to be saved. But friend, everywhere I look, they only did it one way. And if it's good for Peter, there's an old song, if it's good enough for Peter and John and James, it's good enough for me. Amen. Honey, can you play something? I want to take a minute. 
I know I say that and she's over there clunking away on the keys. Oops. Oops. You want ice cream on the way home, honey? <laughs> it's how you make up with your wife. That's how you stay married for 31 years. Listen. Let's just take a minute. We're in the presence of each other. There's nobody here to judge. I'm not your judge. He's your judge. I don't know where you're at in your life, but he knows where you're at. You just make sure you know that he knows exactly who you are and where you're at. And if you're not where you need to be, then you need to get with me and we'll get you to where you need to be. Amen? Let's raise our hands, close our eyes, and begin to talk to the Lord just for a moment. Jesus, Father, we need you. We need your help, oh God. Just understand and open our heart and our mind to your word. God, let us be apostolic like the apostle of God. Let the word get deep in our hearts. Let us not depart from faith, the faith. Let us not depart from the truth of God for convenience. But God, let us cling to your precious words. Touch us in our mind and in our spirit. Stir us, oh God, to do what is right. Stir us, oh God, to love truth with all of our heart, soul, and mind. God, we stand and we give you glory, honor, and praise. Hallelujah. for 36 hours in a truck and we were fine until we got in the snow in Montana boy it was bad and he was driving and I wasn't as confident in his driving and I was in mine you know what I'm saying but I was driving he was driving and I was in the pastor seat and he we're talking along talking along and all of a sudden I felt the truck just kind of give one of those little, if you never drove a truck you don't know give a little slip going again and they gave another little slip now that's when I grabbed the dash in the seat it's hanging on like you got this yeah and then all of a sudden that truck gave a big old whirl like this and I thought that's it and it wasn't even me all of a sudden I heard that name Jesus in Jesus name and I looked over and it was my co-worker and he was smoking a cigarette just 20 minutes before to, at the truck stop and, but man he was all godly now why because when it counts there's only one name you're going to call on right. when you get scared and you're starting to yeah. it's out of control what do you do it's Jesus well, I looked at him and I started God's got this God's got this and that truck straightened out we pulled over we parked it for the night. You know, friend, if someone points a gun at me, you know what I'm going to do? Oh, in the name of Jehovah, put that away. No, friend, I'm going to terrorize him. In Jesus' name, devil! Whoa! Why? Because that name has power. Amen. Let's go forth in that name. I believe that name. Preach that name. Teach that name. Get baptized in that name. Amen. You're dismissed. Shake hands. Be friendly. In Jesus' name.